Hello and welcome to Small Town Big Life Podcast, coming at you from the tool shed behind Grace Fellowship Church in Avis, Pennsylvania. Today we have guest Jerry Miller, who has lived in this area his whole life, right Jerry? And uh, I'm from Columbus, Ohio, in Central Ohio area, so I know nothing about this area and uh, was fortunate enough to get him to uh, agree to come and talk with me and fill me in on the, the history of this wonderful area of Pennsylvania. And um, we, we're going to get started right now. Jackie's flying the plane. Hello. Good afternoon, sir. Hello. So as, as me uh, being from central Ohio, just moving here, this is actually the first time I've sat down with you to have a discussion that I'm looking really forward to. What would you like to tell the listeners about uh, yourself, how long you've lived here and so forth? And I was just born and raised up Pine Creek between Avis and Woolrich and uh, went to Jersey Shore High School and was in the Air Force and met my wife overseas and we got married and went to California and moved back here and it was a good place to raise kids so that's where we ended up. Yeah, I, I love it here. I mean, I've only been here a year, but um, I love it. And your daughter uh, was uh, befriended my wife and spent a lot of time together, and <clears throat> which that conversation is is what led to this happening. So, uh, so you've definitely got some information. So, where, where do you where do you think a good place to start? I mean, me, you've got a new guy here in front of you that really doesn't know the area. If we were back in my hometown, I could talk your ear off. <laughs> tell me, tell me the really interesting. Uh, the need to know stuff and the fascinating stuff about about the area. Well, the biggest historical thing is the Ty Dot and Elm in the area, and it was during the Revolutionary War and all that. Uh, McElhatton and Wayne Township was named after Matt Anthony Wayne, and it's a lot of history in this area back to the Revolutionary War. Uh, Philip Tome was a, a pioneer that settled up Pine Creek, and. Uh, the original name the Indians gave it was the land of dwell, the devils dwelled. Oh, wow. And it was a sacred area, and there was Indian caves at the Black Bridge. And uh, there's just a lot of local history to see if, you want, if you're interested. You know, the original Woolrich Woolen Mills is here, uh, mm -hmm. up in Waterville. The uh, area was big in logging, uh, slate run, camel. Tomes Run, there's a, there's a ton of little places, a lot of stuff that people don't know about. Yeah. I Well, I live out there off of Island Road um, uh, on Lower Creek Drive in, it, it, in that area, and I, was, I, I picked up a book because to prepare for our conversation, <laughs> and I was reading about uh, some of the stuff in the area, um, and... Uh, because I, I wanted to at least be armed with some information. I'm sure there's more in your brain than there is in that book. But uh, just a few folks I've talked to, when you say there's interesting parts about little places, I mean, I, I've noticed there's even stories about in the mountains, the bald patches, when you look up and just see areas of rocks. And uh, But I'm not sure what those stories are. Yeah. Is there anything? Well, the, that a lot of that's from where the glaciers back in the Ice Age came down through and deposited. Okay is what I've been told. Right. And this side of the river is pretty unique. I talked to a fellow from National Geographics. The northern side of the Susquehanna River is a plateau, and all the rock structure runs horizontal. If you're on the south side and you go down toward Harrisburg, that's Teutonic upheaval, and the rocks are slanted when the road cuts. It's just this is an odd section of the I guess the country because this is a, actually a plateau, not upheaval in mountains. Oh wow, that's a, that's very very interesting. It's and this is part of that. This is kind of the part of the Allegheny Mountains, right? Mm -hmm. So, wow. Uh, one thing I've read about and I've heard people discuss now that you're on the the, the, the uh, geology part of it, kind of, is flooding. Yeah. 
So uh, <laughs> where I moved right next to a river mm. is outside of these levees. They put levees downtown, and, mm -hmm. and at my house is a few hundred yards away from the outside. So I'm clearly in the area that they don't care about. I mean, the <laughs> town is protected, the airport is protected, and I can't see over those walls. And I thought, well, the folks on the other side of that wall, they're going to be in good shape when the floods come, but I need a boat. So <laughs> what's been your experience with it as long as you've been here? Because I want to tell you what a little I've read about over the past 200 years here, the, the impression I get is uh, the town has gone through several phases, or the area, I should say, and uh, folks just rebuilt and start over and don't care. They just keep rebuilding and starting over. And um, what's been your experience with that? Well, in 72 flood, they didn't have the dike levee there. Mm -hmm. And when you uh, in Lock Haven, when you're going up the hill, it was the second street above McDonald's where they were tying the boats up. The rest of the town was underwater. And that's why they built the dike levee. And it was above, just above the 72 flood level. Mm -hmm. And there was a town on the other side of the river called Lockport. And they basically bought that whole town up and destroyed it to build the levee on the other side to make that a flood zone on the other side. So what did you yourself, were you paddling water? And I mean, were... I, I was on leave from the service at that time and I was uh, voluntold <laughs> yeah. that I was going to be a heavy equipment operator and truck driver because I could drive truck and I helped to keep 44 open with a bulldozer part-time. And then after the water receded, we went to a lock haven with dump trucks and was emptying the stores out and hauling the stuff to the dump. And uh, my sister lived in Jersey Shore and they had all, but there was four steps up into her house and the water was three inches from the second floor mm. in Jersey Shore. Wow. And on the island where you're living, uh, the people were taken out of the houses in the second story windows and boats. Yep. Yeah, that's what I heard. And that's a fact. Well, somebody told me it's <laughs> due. A couple of people said, well, yeah, well, you know, there was a flood there. There's one every so many years, and it's about time. And I that frightened me. Well, we had well, Andrew, Hurricane Andrew. What was that, 10 years ago? I haven't seen major flooding like 72 since Not, then. There, yeah. was, there was a big ice flood in 68. I read about that and I didn't, I hadn't, <clears throat> you can jump in here anytime you want, but here's what I read and I saw, <laughs> I, I saw some pictures. I, I was curious about the word ice flood and I thought, uh, well, what, what I've seen every weather event you can think of and personally and except sandstorms <laughs> and uh, they said the ice was breaking up and kind of damming water and then the water was raising and then bringing chunks of ice. And it was like a flood with massive boulders of ice just decimating everything in its path. So not just the water, but you've got ice chunks coming in like wrecking balls and ruining everything. Yeah, well, the ice would, would freeze over the river. Yeah. And when I was a kid, the, above the dam, they used to plow that. And the kids could ice skate on that. Well, the ice in a real cold winter will get three, four. The, the, the thickest I remember is six feet. Yeah. And then when it goes out in the spring, it can jam up. And when it jams up, it builds a dam. The water backs up. And when the pressure builds up, then it goes out. And it, you know, it, it's kind of cool to watch the ice go down the river because the trees are shaking and the, hits the bridge. The bridges are shaking. It's. It's kind of a neat thing to watch. It seems <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> to me. I mean, I neat, yes, kind of like a volcano's neat from a distance. Yeah. Yeah, but, I, I wouldn't want to be next to it or into it, but, yeah, it, it, it's, I, when the kids were little, I took them down to Jersey Shore and let them watch the ice go down the river when it broke up. And they thought that was pretty cool because you can hear it groaning and moaning and I, cracking. I and, bet. Mm. Oh, man, I bet that's a sound you don't forget. <laughs> and they used to... Uh, <clears throat> And when they plowed it to ice skate, they used to take and put a Christmas tree out in the center of the river on the dam, on the ice. And then the local radio station had a competition where you could fill out a card and give them a time and a date when the ice went out. 
And when the tree went over the dam, that was when, that was the official time. <laughs> so they made a contest of it, of sorts yeah. out of it. Yeah. That's <laughs> do you do you? I was I was I love uh, talking about history of places and, and, and American towns and things like that. And everyone you talk to has a different answer to this question. But uh, do you? When you look back on your life in this area, do you see one area as the golden era? Like that's when things were just their best and and then here's why and the economy was doing great because of uh, whatever the case may be. I know a lot of a lot of folks have that idea about where they're from about a time that was just kind of magical in terms of I don't know whether it be the 60s, 70s, 80s or 50s or whatever but is there is there any time that sticks out to you more than the others probably when my adult life was when i first come back and i think it was 76 or 77 we came back and uh the economy was booming piper was in town uh I, all the businesses were in was up and running there was the dye works and there was the silk mill and uh wool rich and the steel mill and everybody was going big guns and it was a good Good time economically. Well, then Piper evidently had there was a labor problem, or I don't know what the story was there, but Piper left town and went to Florida. Yeah, I read about that. And, I think it was an ownership dispute about where they wanted to be located, but I'm sorry, go ahead. But they, they had a plant down in Florida, too, Homestead, or I don't know where it was down there. Yeah. But they moved operations, and the economy took a major hit when Piper left. And uh, I was a young guy, had two little kids, and I got laid off for a year, and I couldn't buy a job because of all the qualified people with 15, 20 years' experience from Piper. Did you did you work for Piper? I worked for a machine shop that was local, S and S Tool and Die. So indirectly, your your company worked probably supplied them. Yeah, we we did jigs and fixtures for Piper. We did the, we made the, all the nose landing gear locks for the airplane. Uh, oh, yeah. For people not from the area, talk about Piper real quick so they can understand who we're talking about. Well, Piper Cubs were built back, I'm not 100% sure, but they were big during the Second World War. They used the Piper Cubs as scout airplanes, mm -hmm. and they used them as trainers, and uh, then they evolved into, like, the Cherokees and the all the different, like, personal airplanes and they made some pretty high-end stuff. And so and so for the listeners, that's the airplanes, the Piper airplanes right here in this area. So to get back to where you were, so your your machine shop where you worked, once Piper uh, moved some operations out of town, you were down for a year with no work? Yeah, I, I couldn't. I was cutting firewood and selling it. I, you know, I was scrounging any job I could find to pay my bills and... It ended up that her dad said, well, there's a guy out here hiring machinists. If you can come out by next week, you got a job. So I left the area and went back to California. You got to go where the money is when you got a family. Yeah, and that's when I got out to California, I had $11 left in my pocket, and that's how I had to my name. Oh, man. So we started over from scratch. And then, and then how long were you there before you came back? I don't know, four years, three years? Three years. Were, uh, did you just decide, hey, I want to go home? Or, or or was it California like like it is for me? Like it's a bad cold I got to get away from when I'm there? <laughs> well, we lived in the high country. It was a nice area. Right. And But the problem was there was a lot of drugs, even in the schools. Oh, boy. You know, in elementary schools, when the kids were going to schools, there was kids selling pot in grade school. Yeah. And uh, my dad was sick. And we got a call, and I came back from my dad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'll do it. Family and, uh, yep, that brings us all back. Um, you know, that's a, a God-ordained thing, uh, the heartstrings. You yeah. got to gotta, gotta come back to family. Uh, so <clears throat> at that time, did, did, uh, did Piper bring some work back, or did they stay in Florida? They, they never came back. So that, that airport now where they do— the fly-in? The fly-in. I just, yeah, that's right next to my house. So I, you know, all the past few days, all the planes and activity over there um, to celebrate the, the, history, of the history of Piper. Well, basically, it's like an old family reunion for the Piper owners. The, the guys, 
a lot of those are vintage cubs that they fly in. Yeah. And they'll, they're more than happy to walk you around and talk to you and show you the planes and the difference. But almost all those planes were built in Loch Haven that flew in. Mm -hmm. And they, I, they come from all over the country. Yeah. I, I walked. I went mm -hmm. over there and walked around and looked at them. And, um, yeah, it was quite a colorful event. Yeah, it, it's it's pretty neat. I had a lot of uncles that worked there, mm -hmm. and uh, my uncle Carl took me to Cherry Springs, and he he bought me my first airplane ride on a Piper, and it, I think it was like five dollars. And I said, "Well, you gonna come with me, Uncle Carl?" And he said, "No, I build them things. I'm not flying it." <laughs> <laughs> I used to be a certified RV mechanic, and I used to tell people that's why I'll never buy one of those things. So, uh, but an airplane's a little scarier because no one's ever fallen, you know, 3,000 feet out of an RV. But um, <laughs> an airplane is a whole different ball game. Well, they got a 100% safety record. They never left Do one Do they up. really? They've never left one up. They've all landed. <laughs> I, I did not. <laughs> okay. Uh. Well, so, so what... Um, this is fascinating just talking about you. <laughs> There's a lot about the areas revealed in your life story. So so what did you do when you came back? I was a machinist. Again, for would, how long? Well, I've been retired now, but I have been a, was a master tool and die maker and a master a millwright machinist for 40 years. Oh, wow. Do, do you ever, I know, I know as a guy that works with my hands in construction all these years, do you ever miss it? I mean, like, you know, you know when you do something for a living with your hands, at work, it's work. But you also think, hey, I'd like to make myself a, <laughs> I mean, you, you'd like, you just enjoy what you do, so you'd like to do it to serve your own hobbies. I mean, do you do you miss doing the, the actual, that type of work? Uh, I miss the guys I worked with more than I do the actual work. Yeah, I, uh, that's camaraderie, that's common. I, I've, I've got the scars and stuff from the work that says that, you know, I never had a machine say I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, uh, yeah, it, it. it it was a good life. I've, I've done a lot of really neat things and done stuff to help humanity, I think. Yeah, that's the uh, that's the God path. Those are the good life. I mean, that's the good life. That we was talking to some friends about, um, I did an interview a few weeks ago for some interview thing, and, I, and I, 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 we were talking about what a good life is and what is success and what is what what does it mean to really achieve what you want to achieve in life? And um, you know that old saying about happiness isn't getting what you want, it's wanting what you've got. And when you look back, th the life, like the noble life, the life where you care about your family, where you work hard, where you go through the suffering, where you go through the joy, and all those type of things are what are the gold mine of a life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you see... Um, the people who a lot of us look at and think are successful and, and you learn what's going on and think if that's success no thanks and uh god must love common men because he made a lot of us <laughs> i think john i think johnny cash said something like that something like that yeah so um <clears throat> So um, what, what, else, what else should I know about the area? I know, um, you know, being from Ohio, uh, it's, the Civil War is inescapable because mm -hmm. Sherman's house is over there and all the field trips when we were a kid, we went to the Sherman house, the Georgian house, and the areas where the battles, and they got a big outdoor drama called Tecumseh, and you can't live in Ohio, central Ohio especially, and not have uh, an intimate familiarity with the Civil War, but Pennsylvania has just uh, way more history in the Revolutionary War, which um, to me is just absolutely fascinating. So if I wanted to talk with you and say, hey, uh, where can I go to get some, where, where should I go if I'm a Revolutionary War buff and I want to spend some time, uh, you know, I mean, in relation to where we are now, and I'm sure there's history right here as well. Well, how, what would you think? What would you, how would you respond to that question? Well, the, the, one of the neat things of con Revolutionary War is uh, Pine Creek Cemetery, because there's a lot of guys that died in the Revolutionary War buried there. Oh, wow. On, I didn't know. Well, I'm new here, so I didn't know On that. the way to Jersey Shore at the top of the hill, you, it's not well marked, but it's like an orchard hill or something. There's an art, a lane that turns to the right. You go back and there's an, a Civil War or a Revolutionary War era cemetery in there. 
Oh. And there's a lot of the veterans that died during the revolution or served in the revolutionary war there. Hmm. Uh, but the, the biggest thing in Pennsylvania for the revolutionary war I liked was the Valley Forge. And that, you know, I th was fascinated with that. They got a museum there that you can go in. They found artifacts on the grounds. You can actually walk the grounds and walk into the room where Washington stayed. And, you know, there's a lot of that stuff. Um, there wasn't so many battles fought here. Uh, of course, there was the great, what they called the great runaway when the Indians attacked. They took off and went down the river. And uh, the Tidot and Elm was locked in, according to local legend. Uh, they signed a Declaration of Independence the same day that Philadelphia signed it. The Fair Play men, and they were on their way to to Philadelphia, and they ran into each other down around, I don't know, Sunbury or Harrisburg, someplace. And they passed the news back and forth, and they said, well, we did it up there, too. And they said, well, they did it in Philadelphia. So that's hmm. a, a local legend coincidence, and it's supposed to be buried someplace in a, a, a Dutch oven, but nobody's ever found it, so we don't know if it's fact or fiction. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, but those things are so much so cool to think about. Those. Yeah. There, there's, there's a lot of activity here in this area with Indians uh, fighting each other as well. Yeah, the, well, the, the Iroquois Trail and all that, the Seven Nations, uh, up in Nichols Run area, there's a a monument to an Indian princess named Shawana, and uh, there's there's a lot of a lot of local stuff like up in Lock Haven area, Queens Run was actually owned by the Queen of Spain. And that was all owned up to Farrensville. They had the brickyard, and they come down, built the bricks. And the Fallon Hotel was actually the summer residence for the Queen. She, I know. She bankrolled it, a lot of the work. Uh, I just read about that. I, I didn't expect to see that. That's a, I, I, I don't know how exactly that came to be, though. I don't know exactly how it happened either, but that's... Yeah. She owned a big chunk of land of, across the river. Queen's Runs actually was part of her land holdings. Mm -hmm. And that covers a lot. The watershed covers a lot of area. That goes clear up on the mountain. In that time that she, um, in that era, I was also a little surprised to read about the downtown. I think that was in the 1890s, wasn't it? Something. Does that sound I'm, right? I'm, I'm not real familiar with the dates. I just. Well, it, I guess it's not really important, but, um, the, you know, in that century around that time, I was surprised to learn that it was a big entertainment area. Mm-hmm. Uh, locate with theaters mm -hmm. and live performances and stuff like that. You, you typically don't picture smaller towns being known for that, but they were here. So a lot of those buildings down there, well, unfortunately, a lot of them were lost because of the flood. Mm -hmm. But some of them are still there and refurbished. And I was trying to, I just think that's fascinating because yeah. I think it has a lot to do with the river and travel and commerce. And, and Well, the uh, canal system come up through there. Yeah. And well, that's how Lock Haven got its name was because of the locks that raised them out of the river into the, the canal system. Yep. And the house across the river is, the, is where the park is. That was a lock house. That's where the guy lived, worked the lock. And uh, Water Street in Lock Haven actually was a canal. Yeah. They said Haven because of Haven for, like you just said, for the boats and all that, all the yeah. activity. So, because they, they used to, it was one word and they changed it to two. I don't know. Well, they, they, uh, it runs up Pine Creek. There's a canal up Pine Creek. When you go up Pine Creek, the first house on the left, that was a lock house. Yeah. Uh, the canal come down through South Avis, uh, up on Vargas Island. There's a Vargas road that cuts off. There's another lock in there that's still standing. Uh, the stonework's there. Mm -hmm. And the canal there where the tobacco shed is, going up Lock Haven to the left, that was part of the canal system, and it was a, a lot of grain transported. And wood and lumber. And well, lumber, a lot of that was rafted down the river. Yeah, that's what I mean. It, uh, the river was used for the lumber industry heavily, and, and uh, yeah. Yeah, my grandfathers were wood hicks. Really? Yeah, the one. Uh, he that's, was, a, that's a hard life, I mean, on the back and legs. And that's hard work. Uh, he was, my granddad was a saw, was a, the logger. He was a timber faller, and he, uh, my other granddad ran a sawmill, and my dad 
worked at the sawmill and was firing the boiler and stuff. My mom was the camp cook, and that's how they hooked up. That's, but, that's, uh, that's that, I love those stories. That's a Americana at its finest. But the, the logs, they used to wait till the spring, and they had splash dams. Yeah. And they'd stuck the wood in behind it. And then in the spring, when the water got really high, they'd blow the dam up, and the water would rush down and carry the logs down, and the wood hicks would... Uh, run the logs with pike poles and shove them back in the water and the log raft would come down. It had the bunkhouse and, the, and the, the, the dining hall or whatever you want to call it, a cookhouse. Right. And they would run them down Pine Creek and the Susquehanna and clear down into, uh, I guess, the Chesapeake Bay because the, the, they say that the White Pines for the original uh, Independence sailing ship came from Pine Creek. So there was a, a lot of logging area uh, up on the pike. You'll see a lot of these old, looks like little flat roads up through the woods. They're all dinky railroad grades. Hmm. And this area is covered with them. I was corrected the other day for saying Susquehanna and not Susquehanna. Mm-hmm. You, you can call it whatever you want. But <laughs> I was told that I immediately identified myself as a newcomer uh, because I said Susquehanna. Well, if, if, you, if you call it Pine Creek... Yeah, you're new. Yeah. Instead of Pine Creek, Crick. Pine, Pine Creek is the, is the actual original yeah. spelling. <laughs> really? And it went on like that for about a hundred and some years, and then some English teacher said, "Oh, that's spelled wrong. That's Creek." So she changed. It. But the original spelling was C R I C K. When you see it back in the original <laughs> maps of Philip Tome area. <laughs> That's funny because uh, I had a similar situation where I'm from. If I can add this to the conversation, I uh, grew up in a, well, I was, we lived in a small town actually that I moved back to before we came here, Baltimore, Ohio, two traffic lights, tiny little town, one intersection. And um, there, there, uh, when I was a kid, there was a, they got a swimming pool and the local, they got this, they made a sign that said swim pool. And I remember my grandparents said, my kids are over there to the swim pool. To the, they just called it the swim pool and, that, and not the swimming pool, the swim pool. And because the signs were small and they saved money, so they just put swim pool. And um, they took it down finally and changed it only a few years ago. And it broke my heart because I'd seen it since I was two years old. And my wife contacted the town and told them the story and wanted to know if she could have the signs for me. And they said yes. They gave them to her, and I have them, and I did not steal them or obtain them illegally. I told her, I said, I'm probably the only person that owns street signs legally <laughs> because other people steal them. And uh, But that is so – it takes you back to a way of life. I mean, you know, crick. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's – that's I, I think that's funny. That is that is really really an interesting story. It's so it's too bad you couldn't get your hands on those signs. <laughs> that's incredible. Well, if you go back and look in the old, real old maps, you can see it's still spelled that way in the real old maps, mm-hmm. the originals. That's neat. But there's you know there's a lot of weird stuff here too. It's like oh yeah, go on. <laughs> well, Avis Avis didn't used to be Avis. It was Oak Grove. But it belonged to Woolrich. Hmm. So, okay. The, 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 the company Woolrich owned this area. The, so, the, okay. Who, okay. The company Woolrich, mm-hmm. the company owned the area. Yeah. What the, was the company's primary objective? I mean. that was This was basically like a company town. The people that lived here worked in Woolrich. Mm-hmm. And then the trains come in, the, the rail shops come in on the South Avis side, of course, when the railroad came in, that was big business, so a lot of the guys went to... And I'm not 100% sure of the story, but I, I, my understanding, there was a little bit of shady deal went on, and they got Oak Grove from Woolrich, and then they named it Avis after the mayor's daughter or something like that. Hmm. But uh, okay, yeah, the rail shops was, was what, and South Avis was the other side of tracks. You know, that was the... But that uh, was a big thing here. Well, when I was looking into what to try to read and learn about about the area, I had to go through, flip past a 
number of books about ghost stories in the area <laughs> to get to the ones about just the history of uh I think it's interesting how whenever you've got so much history in an area with so many people, you know, Civil War, Revolutionary War, the Indian tribes, the, like you said, the companies, the business, the booming economies that go up and down, different businesses, um, the airplanes, the logging, so much activity in such a small area, you're bound to get folks who start telling ghost stories or strange things. And when you said there's some weird stuff here, I thought you were going to get down one of those roads and tell me some some strange uh, story about something odd or something like that. Well, there there's plenty of ghost stories here, you know. Yeah, I'm a pastor, so I'm a I have a critical ear, and a, <laughs> I'm also a skeptic. But I I I'm a, I'm a I'm a I'm a human being, so I love good stories. Yeah, I <laughs> I, I have my own little personal deja vu story. I was in England at the time, and I had a favorite aunt. Uh huh. And she was said she's always going to teach me to bowl because she was like a terrific bowler. She could bowl like 300. Oh, my. And uh, I couldn't bowl for nothing. So she kept saying, I'll teach you, I'll teach you. So I was in England, and one night she come and sat on my bed. She said, I'm not going to be able to teach you how to bowl. And I thought that was weird. Mm -hmm. And so it was like I waited till the weekend, and I called home, and I was talking to my folks, and I said to ask my mom, I said, Oh, by the way, how's Aunt Catherine doing? She said, why do you ask? I said, well, I had this weird dream. You know, she's come and said she wasn't going to help me bowl. She said, Aunt Catherine died that night. Hmm. Oh, wow. So. There is, Deb's here too, Jerry's Jerry's wife. Deb, if yeah. you have, if you want to chime in and say something, we would love to hear from you. I'm she, not she, here. You know, you know well, st that doesn't mean you can't add to the conversation if you don't want to. She, she, she just put a little note there and said, I should remind you of Roush Town. Okay. People call it Rock Town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's named after the Roush family. All right. And uh, Prince Farrington was a local uh, character. He was a bootlegger. His, his name was Prince? Yeah. Well, that, his, his real name wasn't Prince. That's just what they called him because he took care of all the people in the area. Nobody would turn him in. Ah, okay. Yeah, like kind of like the uh, Al Capone and other people that get popular with the community. He he, he made whiskey for the government. <laughs> nice. But if his daughter had a bar, and if you she knew who you were, and you could get some of the special stuff, you could get some of Prince Farrington's whiskey, and it was the best bourbon you could ever ask for. It was corn whiskey. Yeah, I have a whole cabinet in my office. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't. But I'll take a little wine for the stomach's sake. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, the, all the local farmers. Uh, he bought all the grain and the corn and stuff. And the people, the 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 guys that cut wood would supply them with firewood for the stills. And the boys would uh, shuttle the barrels. And uh, the house on the other side, the bridge at Jersey Shore, was one of his houses. And there was a tunnel underneath it with a hidden wall. <laughs> and if the, if the revenuers come, they would open it up, and the whiskey barrels would roll down a tunnel into the river. That's and slick. It, and then after they got left, he'd pay the boys to dive down, hook them back up, and bring them back out. Wow. But they would uh, plow furrows and hide the bottles in the furrows and then plow them to hide the whiskey and stuff. And he was during the Prohibition, but he actually made it for the government, the, the congressmen and the senators— didn't go without they they got his whiskey yeah and they, they, I, I would imagine they would offer an extra layer of protection for him at least as much as they could yeah he, so. he's he's a local legend in this area he but you know if the kids needed shoes he bought shoes for them if a family was down and out he gave them groceries if the house burned down he made sure they were taken care of he was no, he was a crook, but he was a good guy. You know, he wasn't a gangster type. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of people like that in, <clears throat> in history. Some of them, like you said, are more Robin Hood types, and some of them are more John Gotti types. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think God uses everyone for a purpose. He can take anything bad and use it for something good. So uh, it, it, it's, it's nice to know that uh, those people that were touched in a time of need were. It's also fascinating. You think when you drive around the area and you see places like that, not you don't think about that. Like unless I talk to someone like you who already knows that, you just drive by and don't give it any thought. But there's so much history. I I want to know the hit. The house I live in was built in 1865, and it's what you would expect. Um, 
if you put a basketball on the floor, it'll roll to the other side of the room. It's mm -hmm. it's it's out of level. There's nothing straight. It's like do it looks like Dr. Seuss built the house, <laughs> but I love it. I mean, and I always wonder what is the history of this place, you yeah. know? And the area, I wanna I wanna move into a different area just for a second because uh, this is a this is you're probably gonna laugh when I ask you this. I am. Uh, I grew up in the southern woods, in the woods of southern Ohio, and I, uh, around, I'm not afraid of anything that walks, talks, or digs holes, but uh, we didn't have bears or rattlesnakes, and I didn't know those existed here until I agreed to come here. <laughs> and someone told me that where I am is one of the heaviest areas for rattlesnakes, and which is outside of Piper, right down there, on on right outside the island, so across the water, and... Um, so every day I think about rattlesnakes when I'm walking around outside. Just I never had to think about this back home before, and I never had to think about bears back home before. Well, most of the time, the bears are more afraid of you than you are them. If they got cubs with them, you know, a female with cubs, that's you want to be pretty leery of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, that I know from watching nature shows. Well, I've I've had some close encounters with them in the woods when I was hunting archery. I was as close to me to you as from a mother bear with three cubs. Mm. I was entirely too close. I would say so. And the hair come up on her back like a dog and her mouth, teeth were going pop, pop, pop. And I whistled and waved my hat and I just, she, she backed up and I backed up and she woofed and the cubs went and climbed a tree and she was telling me back off, you know, so. I eased back, and she eased back, and then she went on her way, and I went on my way. But I was sneaking through thick laurel, and I got entirely too close to her. That did was you Did fault. you see her? Not until I come around a laurel bush, and there she was. Hmm. Okay, that's I got I got the hair on my neck stand up when you just tell the story. I uh, I, I can't imagine that would be. Yeah, that would be pretty. You said when you said her hair stood up on her back, I thought, oh no. Yes, but the, they 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 uh, usually give you warnings. They'll they'll like the hair will come up like a dog's back when they're growling, and their teeth will pop and stuff. And if you're out in the woods and one sees you, sometimes they'll bluff charge you, and then they'll stop like 20 feet away and they'll back up and then they'll charge you a couple times. But you got to really do something drastic to to make a, a black bear get after you. You must have some food or something. Yeah. In my opinion, I've been close enough that I had a, a bear cub brush my pant leg running to its mother behind me. Mm. And I screwed up that time. I was hunting out a dinky track, and I heard this. I thought it was a deer. Fill pants now. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked down, and there's two little cubs playing. I thought, boy, that's really cute. <clears throat> and then I was watching them, and all of a sudden I heard Mom go, woof. And I look back, and she's standing up like this behind me in the laurel bush. And I thought, oh, please, cubs, don't squeal. <laughs> if they'd have squealed, she'd have had me for lunch. She woofed again, and they come running up. One ran by and brushed my pant leg and went up to her, and they took off. Oh, I bet time stopped for you. I mean, it would feel like it. I would. I know it would for me. It. It. I've run into them several times in the woods archery hunting. It. They don't bother me. I don't bother them. So, And rattlesnakes, they usually give you warning. You know, they'll buzz and stuff. They don't want, you're too big to eat. They don't want to bother you. And if you stomp uh, around and make noise, they leave. So I'm more worried about getting bit. I mean, I've picked up all kinds of snakes and even, you know, I'm not, um, I'm not afraid of snakes, but I don't want to get bit by a poisonous snake. And, um, you know, like I said, rattlesnakes aren't something I'm used to, unless you're close to the water where I'm from, you don't really have to be too worried about any kind of poisonous snake. The tim timber rattlers back here, in my opinion, are pretty docile. you got to basically step on them or do something to get them to bite you. Like when my dad worked in the woods, I worked in the woods with him, and I was cutting, I was swamping out a log road, and I sidestepped and knelt down and was sawing a log, and I felt something brush my pant leg and looked down, and the yellow rattler come up by my leg over the log under my arm while I'm sawing. And uh, I'd I have sawed him right in half. I just told my dad, I said, there's another one. So he got a switch and switched him. And Would you, what do you mean, just gets after him? Like, yeah, a, little, just starts... a switch about this long and is not much bigger than your finger will kill him quicker than a club. Just swat him. Smack him. 
You just swat them back of the head, and that they're done. It just fixes them. They're not bad eating either. Yeah, I heard that. I heard they were. They're bony like an eel, but they're good. They were like bony like a what? An eel. I've never had an eel. The most exotic food I've ever had is. We had this conversation with somebody the other day. Not very interesting. I think shark, swordfish, that kind of stuff. I've never had. I had alligator. Um, I, but I've never had anything. I mean, eel, I've never had. Where do you get that? I know they don't sell it at Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they used to live in Pine Creek. We used to catch them when I was No a kidding. Kid. Freshwater yeah. eels lived down there? Yeah. They're coming back. They they have a dam down. Uh, I don't know where the dam's at for sure, but uh, they just lifted, I think, what they say, 10,000 of them or something like, back up over the dam to get them back up in the river because they migrate. So what, hang on a second. They so they moved them from one spot to another to yeah they get they, they 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 swimming up creek to to uh, to spawn right and they hit the dam they can't get over the dam how how big are these things they're fresh they're freshwater eels you know, how, they get three or four feet some of them so I've never seen them so are they dangerous and I mean no they're not, they're slippery don't you try to pick them up it's like well you know how some eels have really sharp teeth and they're no, they'll, they'll, they'll bite. Uh, so I don't yeah. know. They're not like a moray or anything like that. They're just a... But you say they're pretty tasty. Hell yeah, they're good. So how do you catch them? Like a net yeah. or fishing pole? If we, were, we were fishing, night fishing for bass usually. And it, you know, whatever we could catch, catfish, whatever. We'd catch eels. The only thing is you got to cut them up in pieces or they'll they'll kick out of the pan. Well, yeah, so I was going to say, I don't know how to clean an eel. I imagine like a catfish. You pull the skin off with pliers? No, time. you just dip them in hot water and strip them. So, yeah, they're they're good eating, but you gotta, like I said, you have to cut them up. I've never, I'm, I have a goal now. <laughs> <laughs> well, the ones they're bringing up, they, they're you probably won't catch any in Pine Creek or the river for years to come. But they're they're like the shad. There used to be a lot of shad. Yeah. And then they put the dam in, and that stopped the migration, so they they don't have the sham here. There used to be salmon in Pine Creek mm -hmm. and in the river. So there's not, well, yeah. What is what what is in that in that like where I am? Is there any? I mean, what what is there to fish for? I mean, but you know, if if I see waters like this where I'm from, I'm thinking uh, smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, catfish. That's about it. I mean, I, no, I'm not too familiar with the river, but I know there's smallmouth and probably catfish and uh, rock bass, bluegills. Uh, just your basic stuff. Just your basic stuff. You said stuff. no salmon, nothing like that. No, not, there used to be salmon, but there's none none in my lifetime. Right, okay. Well, there's a spot down Pine Creek where they call the salmon hole where they used to build fish weirs, and they would catch them, and then the, the, the carp and the suckers and all that, they would feed to the pigs in the wintertime. They'd pack them in barrels and feed the pigs. With Don't them. eat from the Susquehanna River. Mm-hmm. Don't eat from the Susquehanna? No. Why is that? I don't eat any fish where I don't drink the water. Right. Right. So is it dirty? In my opinion, it is, yeah. Okay. There's too many uh, waste treatment plants upstream. Okay. It, but, yeah, that, I guess that was another question. I was wondering how clean how clean it is. Because where I'm from, that's the same thing. There, I, I wouldn't eat nothing out of it. Those waters? It's a lot better than it used to be because there was a lot of mine acid. And then they've done a lot of mine reclamations and treated it. And the fish are coming back. There's, uh, I wouldn't, I'd eat the bass and stuff. Uh, I wouldn't make it a meal every week, but I'd, I'd eat it occasionally. But that's like Pine Creek, the bass, and there's the walleye and pike and trout and all kinds of stuff in Pine Creek. And I don't don't hesitate to eat them. So pine pine. But down so. down below toward Williamsport, that area, uh, the fish have some diseases and stuff. There's like, they think it's from the chemicals or the. I don't know what they call it, from the medicines that people had taken, and then they go through the waste treatment plant and they get in the river, and it's oh, yeah. causing like defects in the fish down into the lower part of the river. It surprises me at how some some of the places, the things they allow into the water. Um, <clears throat> I took a picture one time. I was at a, and I know this is not just uh, where I was from back home, um, but I was in a gas station, and it was like a big gas station, and I was pumping gas, and I looked down, uh, and I saw the grate, the storm grate, you know, 
and I saw a little icon of a fish. And I didn't know. I thought, why is that there? And I, I got a little closer and a little closer, and it said, um, do not pour oil. This drains into local waterways. And I'm looking around. I'm like, this is a gas station with antifreeze and dirt coming off of cars and oil that leaks, and that drains into a waterway. And mm -hmm. I, I thought, that that who? I mean, that's insane yeah. <laughs> to me. That's insane to allow something like that. But uh, and I'm I mean I'm a I'm a realist. I don't you know I know. Um, I think uh, I think some people go to extremes and make things look worse than they are when it comes to save the planet. But also, we do have a responsibility to be good stewards, and I think that is just blatant disregard for uh, taking care of your area. Um, I, I don't know. I, I'm 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 assuming, like I said, if it goes on there, it must go on in a lot more. Yeah, a lot more places. Well, that's like the the one little run over that goes over South Avis. Uh, the locals called that Grease Run. And the reason is you don't ever want to step in it. It's oh, only only my. about that deep. But there's about four feet of grease down in there from the rail shops and the car shops and stuff. And they just leave it there? Well, it's it's down in the water, and it's, like, sunk down. That's Separated, yeah. It's it's deep down in there. That's, but locals call it grease run. So you, can, you can dip down in. There's grease down in there, like old uh, wheel bearing grease and lubricating grease. But that, they, that's that's disturbing. And up in Lock Haven, Bald Eagle Creek used to change colors, depending on what colors they were running at the dye works in the paper mill. Mm -hmm. The water would turn colors from the dye in the water or the dye from the the mills, and there would be big chunks of foam coming down the, the Bald Eagle Creek. But they uh, they've cleaned that up over the years. It, that, that water's a lot better. There's fish back in it. And, there's fish back in the river. There didn't used to be, but there is now. I've seen a little bit of foam and bubbles in my area. Well, that some of, some of it's going to occur natural, but sure. I mean, this was like washing machine foam up mm -hmm. a foot. Well, foot that's high. what I mean. I saw some against a branch, about an eight foot section this big, yeah, trapped okay. up against a branch. It was. It looked a little more than. Uh, I have to baptize a couple people there in a few weeks. I hope they don't turn into toxic Avengers once I bring them up out of the water. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the stuff the stuff is is like I said, the water's a lot cleaner than it was when I was a kid. Yeah. Oh, so it's better now. Oh yeah, it's a lot better. Oh good. But they've they've like up in in the creek, they used to fence in part of the creek, and the guys would have their cows, and the cows would go down to the water to drink. That was the water source. Yeah, they had to. And that was, you know, they, they plowed up next to the creek, and they, they spread the fertilizers, and they, they stopped that. So, And the factories there some discharge their wastewaters like they used to. They have to test it. Like the paper mill had to test every, I don't know, two or three hours to test the water quality, the pH, and all that. It's a, it's a lot better than it used to be. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so do, you, do you actively fish around anymore? I did until I messed my knee up. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. I can, but I'm 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 mainly a trout fisherman. I don't fish a lot in the creeks or the river. Okay. I fish the mountain streams. I like I don't. You go for the good stuff. <laughs> well, I, like I said, I don't eat any fish out of the water. I won't drink. Yeah. And I don't fish for stocked fish. I, you, right. Yeah. That's another thing. Yep. I well, a friend that. of mine worked at the hatchery, and she said you shouldn't be eating all those fish. And I said why. She said the food that they feed them has PCBs in it. You shouldn't eat it more than once a month or once a week or something. I said, well, I don't eat where they stock. She said, oh, then that's all right. What's that, some kind of growth hormone or something? It's it's something. I don't know what it is, but it's a, it's a cancer-causing chemical. Oh, that's that's comforting. You know, if you, if you eat a massive amount of it. Yeah. Know, but she's because I was going out religiously and getting them. She, she eats them as fast as I can catch them. But, you're not. You're fearless, right? <laughs> but so, the mountain trout—they look—they look different. They're, they're pretty, and I—I I go up and I've taken pictures of grouse and deer and bear and all stuff, kinds of stuff when I'm out fishing. So. Oh wow! I bet that's a good trip. Yeah. Do you, do you just go out and spend a day there, or do you, are you like hardcore pitch a tent, be there for two days type of guy? I have gone up for a couple of days. I carry used to carry a hammock. Yeah. And. Uh, all I need is a pocket knife to 
<laughs> you, took, you, you took a hammock so you could really relax. Yeah. The first time I saw a hammock, I thought, so that's what trees are for. A balled up hammock and pills up about the size of your fist. Yeah, no, I know I'm exactly. With us. And, uh, yeah, I slept on the ground under hemlock trees and everything else. But then, yeah. But uh, I haven't done that so much since we got married. I'm getting older. My beds are comfortable. Oh, yeah, I know. I don't. I don't, I got a lot of buddies that are into camping. I did that as a kid and we lived out in the woods. So some of my friends that camp, I mean, I'm, I've mostly always tried to live in the country somewhere. There's different types of country. There's flatlands farming country. And then there's the woods country. I grew up in the woods, but I've lived in both throughout my life. And I've, I had so many friends that lived in that environment. They were like, we want to go camping. I'm like, I can walk outside, <laughs> and I can sleep out there all night if I want. And if I don't like it, I can come in the house and make a peanut butter sandwich. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not investing in tents and all that stuff and going out. And I did it when I was little. But uh, as a grown-up, I've always lived somewhere where I've had 24-7 access to nature. Uh, thank the Lord that I've had a good life like that. And... Um, so I could never, I, for me personally, was never into the whole really investing a lot of time and effort and work. It's, it is work. I mean, for guys who do it, you get you got to gather all your gear, you got to figure out where you're going, you got to set everything up, and then you got to clean it all up. You got you take all that time. I don't know. It's <laughs> God bless them, but I would rather just uh, go drop the tailgate somewhere with a cooler full of Pepsi and a a fishing pole and make it a day yeah i i usually carry a bag of jerky and a pack of gum and if i don't come back she knows not to worry about me till the next day yeah mm -hmm. but boy i don't know it seems like you have a habit of running into mother bears <laughs> so. well I, I've, I've probably got pictures of cubs and everything else it just the bear bears are are basically timid they're they're i'm more afraid of a, somebody's big city dog then i'm a bear yeah well that's a good point i mean a bear ultimately they just want you to leave them alone they want to go on about their business yeah. whereas I, dogs can you know go ahead i'm sorry i've been picking blackberries and come around the bend and near the bear was coming the other way so i talked to him i said you go that way you can have those ones and i'll have these ones on this end and <laughs> they they went and i went <laughs> you had a mutual agreement yeah, yeah we, we come to an understanding yeah okay well, that's good. And my, my brother was, we were a muzzle loader hunting. Really? And what were you hunting for? Deer. Yeah. And I was putting a little chase on for him. My younger brother was sitting out by a spring, and uh, he got on the walkie-talkie, and he told my brother, he said, hey, he said, I see a bear out here. He's headed your way. And my older brother, he's like I am. He's hard of hearing. And he kept hearing this rustling. He turned around. It was a squirrel. Turned around. It was a squirrel. So... He was sitting there watching, and I was coming the other way. And he said, all of a sudden, he heard this noise and turned around. He said, I could have reached out with my pocket knife and touched him. <laughs> the black bear walked in. He said, I never heard it coming. Well, the, just a single black bear, not a just, mama. Just a single one. Yeah. And he said, go on, get out of here. Oh, man. And he said, it went away and just uh, looked back and walked away. And he said, go on, get out of here. Jeez. But it... it uh, he he had a sandwich in his backpack, so <laughs> I said he should have shared the sandwich with him. Yeah, that's what that's what. Uh, well, it's like you said, and your odds of running into one may have something to do with whether or not you got food on you. Yeah. Which I don't plan to go out, you know, roaming through the woods with a slab of bacon tied around my neck or anything. But uh, <laughs> at the same time, I would want to be a little careful. Yeah. So, um, so uh, what what do, what do you think about? Um, so we kind of talked about the, the working here and your history here and then moving and then the waterways and Piper and then the outdoor life, which I'm still, I'm impressed if you were hunting deer with muzzle loaders cause that's a, that's a skill set in itself. Um, uh, what was it like raising kids here? Like the schools and the community and the churches and, you know, there, there are places that are ideal for that, and some places are not. Now, I'm going to tell you, I know nothing about it, but what little I observe, it seems like it would have been a great place for that. I, th I thought it was. Well, she was the one that decided to bring them back Very from good. California. Yep. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. And oh, you did? I did. You should have been in this conversation and because you've got a lot of uh, to compare to. And it, it was different than this completely. Okay. Very different. 
But when we married and came here, she she was born in California, but her schooling was here Starting from here. kindergarten. Yeah, we're talking about Jerry's daughter. Okay. Deanne. Um, very good school. Avis was outstanding in the district. We went back to California, like when Piper closed. And the school was oh, good. It was up country. So the school was okay. It was good. But it wasn't like this area. This, right. It, the area was not like this. Okay. So when he got the opportunity to work here, the job came open, and his brother said, come now or don't bother. He came now. He, I said, take us home. We'll go back to Pennsylvania. That is the place the girls need to grow up. Right. I said, I willingly said, take us back. Yeah. So I left my home again, and we came back here, and I said, they need to grow up here. I cannot duplicate here, there. Right. Even if I had a lum- in l- unlimited source of funds, it would have been a gated community. Yeah. And that's not what I wanted. Sure. And it would have had the guards everywhere. It would have been a safe, but it would have been gated. Right. And they would not have been able to just, just go place for the day. So overall, you, you, in the Midwest and here, and in Pennsylvania in particular, I mean, your goal was this is just a better place to raise right. a family. So we, I said, take so, us back. So And I said, I, will, I want to live in Avis. Yeah. I want her back in the Jersey in the Avis. I want her back at Avis School in Jersey Shore. So we spent nine months in Lock Haven. We got the place here, and then we went back to Avis School after three years. And Jackie said, "Oh, we've been waiting for you. Welcome back. We knew you'd be back. Uh-huh. Welcome back." And I had you know Jeannie then, and then they said, "Come back. Welcome back, uh, Dan. Take your sister around Shore the, the school, uh, and like we never left. Like we had never." Right. What, what's odd is there's probably a dozen kids in this area yeah. that call her mom, mom and dad. And the doctor dad. said, oh, he's love your charts. Don't worry about it. Just pull them right out. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And they call us mom and dad, and our daughters call them mom and dad. Yeah. You know, but it's like like mom and, mom and dad Miller or whatever. So even with unlimited funds, I could not have accomplished that out there. Right. Yeah, the doctor said, oh, yeah, you're charging here. Don't worry about it. How's those ears? I, you know? I, I, there's, got, there's something good that feels good, too, about coming back home. Like yeah. when you when you seek that out and you get home, uh, you take that breath and you go, ah, we're here. Even though it was a different doctor, he had her charts. And he said, yeah. oh, the ears. How's those ears? You, you know, and she's she's it, this was just this is a very good place to raise children. I would not want to raise them anywhere else. She's from a totally different atmosphere, though, because she was born in Oakland. Yeah. And raised in the Bay Area. In the 60s, the, the, the Haight-Ashbury and the race. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you were right there. Yeah. So she, then she moved right into, the thick of it all. like, the suburbs. And so she's a suburbanite type. Yeah, yeah. And But even with unlimited funds, it's not the same. Yes, you could create the same safe. Yeah. But it's not the same. But when There's the, guards everywhere. It's a gated community. There's, you know, um, it's not the same. Right. There's not that, like Jeannie would, her sister would go, and I don't know if you've been down Central Avenue of Avis, but there's the the, the, the water that runs, what is it, the water that runs there, and they yeah. have the... I won't say the name of the week call, but that's fine. <sighs> Where they, they go play in the creek, the, the, those round things, yeah. what are they? The pipes. Of- the pipes. They go play in the pipes. <laughs> I couldn't allow that out there. No. Even if they were there, you wouldn't. No. Um, in San Francisco, the yeah. pipes probably had a cult in them so and having a so meeting. And so there they would just spend the afternoon playing in the water pipes that run un- under the road in, in Avis. Well, yeah. The kids knew to behave Yeah. because anything they did, I yeah. was a volunteer fireman and I coached Little League Baseball also. Right. Everybody in town knew me. Yeah. And if they did anything... I knew about it before they got home. So you want yeah. that kind and of environment where it's safe to let them just go. Go know, ahead and play the pipes under the t- under the road. It's okay. It's cool. Sure. And yeah. the, the, the cops give my youngest one a ticket, going to a ball game because she was speeding. Yeah. I'm going to give her a warning. So he came to my house and gave me a copy of the ticket before I left to go to the <laughs> ball game. <laughs> That's one of the, one of the perks. <laughs> it's this kind of area, you know. It was just all the all the people knew the kids. The kids knew the people, and they trusted them. And when she was little, yeah. she would walk to the bus stop when she was little. Yeah. And had trouble with a kid, you know, picking on her. Yeah, yeah. We all so get that. Two or three doors down. Sure. 
So what we did, and we could not have accomplished that in California either. So what we did was we put the very girl that was picking on her right. in charge of her and said, oh, there's someone picking on her. You want to make sure she doesn't get picked on, right? So uh, we made the, we guilted her into it, whatever, and put her, the I, one that actually picked on her, the one on Summit Street, in charge of the kindergartner. She never got picked on again I, from I that I went to one. school. So you weren't worried that the, that the, 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 the other kid would go, ha, 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 No, we, we, <laughs> we, that's the way the she was raised. That right. Somehow she knew because she said, oh, God, now I'm in charge of her. Sure, sure. And I said, well, that's now, an interesting. You know, that's an interesting angle. If you, you know, you make sure that no one hurts her, right? Right. And... That girl never picked on her again in the whole kindergarten year. This conversation just skyrocketed in interest. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We're actually we're we're about out of time. Um, uh, oh man, Jerry, you've had, you you Deb, you guys have had a pretty rich life. I mean, I thank you for your service too. You said you was in the Air Force, right? She was too. Yeah, you were too. That's how I met her. You guys, you guys have had a uh, contributed a lot to the to the quality of life for a lot of people without even knowing it. Just your service. Uh, I know your daughter, who's amazing, uh, part of and works in leadership in our church, has a lot to do with it. Um, and her husband, and you were a machinist. You've got your you're both tied to deeply in history and th this town. I mean, you guys are the very fibers of the cloth of the. Uh, of this country, so uh, I love I love having conversations like this. So I want to thank you both for your service. Thank you for talking with me today and giving me all the insight. And uh, we're not on any discipline schedule here. So as we close out, what would you what what else would you like to add before we say goodbye and before we tune out about the area or your life here or or anything? Um, I'm, I know there's a lot we could talk about with this area, but. Uh, what like if what would you want to say to someone who's not from here and thinking about coming here? Because I will tell you real quick, when I tried to research the area before I moved here, it was hard to find any information on about the area that I felt was you know substantial. So what would you say to someone who doesn't know the area? Well, if you're interested in the history of the area, there's two guys that wrote books. You might be interested in one was Colonel Shoemaker. Uh, he deals with the Revolutionary War and all that. Mm -hmm. And Philip Tome wrote a book, uh, 40 Years a Hunter, about that's strictly about pine cricket in this area. And it, it's, there's a lot of, uh, like I said, there's a lot of little strange things that you, people, even local people don't know. Because uh, a, a friend of mine has, there's a pile of rocks up in the woods, looks like a beehive. And she yeah. said about, where's that at? And I said, well, there's a, it's either up on the Bull Run Road or out in Dyer Farm. So they took a picture and sent it in. I said, oh, that's out Dyer Farm. I said, and if you walk around the backside, that's a spring. And she said, what? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, how do you know that? And I said, my dad helped build that when the CC camps were in the area. Oh, wow. And she said, well, how did he know that just by the description? And she said, he just knows the area. So, but I'm, no, I'm more familiar with the woods than I am with the town. Yeah. Oh, that's that's cool. I don't I don't know. So are there mountain lions? Are there mountain lions around here? They say that Pennsylvania Game Commission swears there's none here. Mm -hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. And why is the team called the Nittany Lions? <laughs> Back in the day, there was a lot of them. OK. Uh, my granddad was working in a lumber camp going from one camp to another. And a, one was following him. And he said he picked up a broken trace. And. Uh, kept banging the rails and the cat kept following me. He said, I walked backwards for about a mile and a half, two miles. He said the cat kept following him. That's scary. I've seen that. Yeah, that's, that's scary. I've seen videos of cats doing that with people and that you can't turn your back on them. No. It, uh, I have another question. It may sound silly, but um, what's Nittany? Nittany lion. Is that, is that the name of the area or a mountain close by or why are they called N Nittany lions? Mount Nittany was like Nittany Valley. Okay, so it's the area. Nittany Mountain Range, yeah, it's the area. Okay. That, that's, I presume that's an Indian word. That's like Susquehanna is, is an Indian word. Sure. And uh, there's a lot of Indian names, Cinnamahoning, Shemokin. You know, there's a lot of Indian names in the area. Okay. Uh, the Bald Eagle Range is named because there was like, used to be loads of bald eagles. And There's a few that fly up and down the river in front of our house that we see occasionally. Yeah. I've never seen one as a kid, 
until five years ago that I started seeing them again. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen them in person. I've seen every other, except until I moved here. Yeah. Now they fly up and down. There's one or two that flies over the water in front of our house, up and down the. They're great fishermen. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Yeah, they sure are. I, I, up in the, the Little Pine Dam, there's two nests of them up there. Those nests are big. And, uh, uh, yeah, uh, bigger than I think maybe people realize until you see one, and I'm sure you know this, they're pretty. Oh, the, the osprey are up there too. The what? Osprey. They're, they're a big, big bird. I don't. My younger daughter's a, the, the guru on the animal. She's. Right. She, but. Uh, you send an osprey kind of like a hawk. Is it? They're, they're, I don't, I don't they, know. They fish too. Yeah. But they're, they're, it's, it's, they're big, almost big as an eagle. Mm hmm. Okay. But my favorite one's the peregrine falcons. I love to watch them. Oh yeah, yeah. They're <clears throat> well. What I'm, you know, growing up where I did, the most common bird we saw are red tail hawks, and um, so you know, and those those turkey buzzards are in the whole Midwest. You see those things everywhere. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I haven't heard. I haven't seen. I don't think I have. Or is that like a? It's a falcon. Yeah, the peregrines are they're little, but. Uh... I used to hunt, and I'd chase pigeons out of the trees just to watch them get on them. Yeah. And they come out of the, the sky like a rocket. Yeah. It looks like somebody busted a feather pillow, and they take, drive them right to the ground. I mean, they're, they're impressive. But they, they hit like 150 miles in a dive. And they're, oh, they're, my. They're, they're impressive. Yeah. But there's like great horned owls are neat, too. Oh, yeah. That's a rare thing. I've only seen owls in person uh, encountered him twice and once was for a very long time and it stood t I took a bunch of pictures of it which was odd I thought to myself it must be sick but um yeah seeing an owl I've, I wasn't a great horned owl though I just saw a, a, the, the barred owl it was about yeah, that big barred owls screech but, owls but the, born owls the big ones yeah I haven't I haven't I haven't been lucky enough to run across one of those and it's a di don't you think it's a different experience too than when you watch it on film or seeing something there's it's different when it's right in front of you I cut down a, a, a white pine tree one time and was trimming it up and there was a baby owl there and I got put my leather gloves on and I caught it and uh, set him on the end of the log pile, and I kept looking around, looking around. The guy said, what are you looking for? I said, I'm looking for Mom and Dad. Yeah. He said, what do you mean? I said, this thing's a baby, and it was about this tall. Mm. Yeah. And it had talons, like, as long as my finger. I know. When when they say those things are sharp, man, they're not kidding. They're needle, yeah. they're, they're. Needle yeah. sharp, yeah. I tried to attract, and I got to wrap this up, but I just got to tell you this real quick. It's funny. On my, uh, I was having problems with pigeons in my barn, and I wanted to attract an owl. And I don't know how to do that. So I got on the Internet and started looking about how to attract an owl. So uh, I, I found this, this web page from the High Department of Natural Resources or something. Anyway, it was explaining how to build an owl box and where to put it on the property. And yet there's all these very specific things. And it says, uh, it, it says it, in big letters, if you annoy the owl, it will go away. And I thought... Oh, okay. And then under that, it said, how to tell if you're annoying an owl. <laughs> so I scrolled down to read what it said. And it said, uh, when you are looking at the owl, if it spends, <laughs> if it spends more than 40% of its time looking back at you, you are annoying it. <laughs> I thought, I, because it tells you it can't be somewhere that you mow around or that you drive a tractor around and it, the tree... It has to be so high up and face a certain direction. And if the owl is looking at you, apparently you're getting on its nerves. So I, I didn't even try. I just bought one of those fake owls, and that worked for about three days. And then the pigeons started pooping all over it, and they didn't care about it anymore. And it didn't really work beyond that. But um, that's that's my cool owl story. Pellet gun works good for pigeons. What does? A pellet gun. Yeah, but there's just too many. And it's, they're out in the barn, and I, I, I'm telling you, this this was a they're big— good, They're good eating. Pigeons? Yeah. And you won't eat fish out of the Susquehanna River, but you'll eat a pigeon that's been under an overpass for four hours, high on carbon monoxide. <laughs> in the barn? They ain't no. on the overpass. I'm just kidding with you. <laughs> All right, I think we're going to close out. Jerry, Deb, did you guys want to say anything before we sign off? I'm good. You're good. I want to thank you both for coming. It was a pleasure meeting you and uh, a, a very informative, entertaining discussion. And you're welcome back anytime to talk about anything. 
So, uh, and I want to thank Jackie for flying the plane. And this is uh, Pastor Drew with Small Town Big Life Podcast. And we will see you next time. Thank you so much for listening.